Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Erin Walton, and I am the Executive Director of Resilience. We are an independent, not-for-profit organization dedicated to the healing and empowerment of sexual assault survivors, working with folks in the Chicagoland area. We're here today for a very special conversation with two women making a real difference for survivors of sexual violence. As part of our initiative to celebrate those in our community who are making a difference and embody our organization's theme, which this year is Resilient Together, I am delighted to be speaking with Congresswoman Sherry Bustos and Tanuja Gupta, a technologist and activist. Before we begin, I'd like to say that I'm honored to be here with them, both highlighting their important work. And I know our audience will really enjoy hearing more about the work they're doing in politics and law and beyond. So let me start with just some brief introductions. Representative Sherry Bustos is a Democratic member of House Leadership, serving the hardworking families in Illinois, 17th Congressional District. As a working mom who raised three sons, advocating for women and families is a significant part of the Congresswoman's life and career. As a champion to end forced arbitration, Congresswoman Bustos was proud to see her bill, the Ending Forced Arbitration of Sexual Assault and Sexual Harassment Act, that's a mouthful, um, be signed into law earlier this year. So congratulations for that. And thank you for joining us. Thank you, Erin. Yeah. We are also honored to be joined by Tanuja Gupta, um, who is a technologist and activist. Tanuja was one of the lead organizers of the global Google walkout in 2018, when thousands of Google workers walked off the job in response to the company's poor handling of decades of sexual misconduct. And she helped form Googlers for enforced, excuse me, Googlers for ending forced arbitration. After three years at Google, Tanuja has since left and is now enrolled in law school. So congratulations to you as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, welcome to you both. And I think we'll just start this conversation with me just diving in with a few questions. Uh, we'll start with you, Congresswoman Bustos. Um, your bill to end forced arbitration for sexual assault and sexual harassment was signed into law back in March of this year. Um, tell us about this bill and what inspired you to be its chief sponsor. All right. Well, why don't I why don't I start kind of with a, the broader picture, what led to the bill and yeah. briefly explain what it is. So um, I'm a former journalist. And so I'm, I'm like an old fashioned former journalist, and I still like to read newspapers. And so uh, five years ago, I pick up the Washington Post and I read this very, very long story um, that talked about this, the parent company of Kay and Jared Jewelers. And, you know, we also were, we're especially seeing those ads run right now, but, you know, it had no idea kind of what was happening behind the scenes. Um, and what was happening was there were these male bosses they, where they would have these meetings that would be in some cases out of town. So these overnight meetings and they would invite the women employees who were not allowed to bring, if they had a boyfriend, if they had a husband, they weren't allowed to bring any males with them. And they, these would be filled with alcohol. Um, one woman described the meetings as, uh, as being meat being, that, that was being shopped. Um, there were women employees who were expected to undress publicly uh, there was a woman who told a story that she woke up and she was, uh, the, the, uh, after, um, uh, uh, you know, that she was out and she woke up and she was being raped. Um, you know, so, so this story, just one, st one story after the next, after the next within this um, long article was just worse than the one before. Um, and it, it talked about 60,000 plus women at this, this workplace had been subjected to bad behavior. Um, and the reason none of us heard about it is because they were all operating, working under what was called forced arbitration. I had never heard that term, Aaron. I'm not a lawyer. Um, and so I'd never heard that word until I read this story. And what forced arbitration means is that if you have um, a difference with your employer, that um, you need to do something about it. Like in this case, sexual harassment or sexual assault. 
Um, the in their paperwork when they first started as employees was language in there that said that if if something like this happens, you have to uh, go to an arbitrator. That, by the way, is paid for by the employer. And um, the the most common outcome of arbitration when it's paid for by an employer is that it is not found in favor of the employee. And the other part of this is that they are silenced. Um, they can't talk about this with their their, their colleagues. Um, but but so so then zoom out a little bit. And it's not just this one company, but there's 60 million Americans who are operating or working under forced arbitration clauses, all right? So you realize that this is just one horrible, horrible story um, involving 60,000 plus women, but this is 60 million people are operating under, under these forced arbitration clauses. So what happened then is I wrote a bill um, after, I just couldn't believe that this was allowed to happen in America. And um, we there's like a whole bunch of twists and turns that led to us getting this passed out of the House and Senate earlier this year and then going to the White House. Tunisia was there um, going to the White House uh, to get this signed into law. But um, what that law does, and this is what's important to share with everybody who's zooming in on this, but is as of March, when President Biden signed this into law, all forced arbitration clauses in your contract, an employee contract, if you if you check off on a terms and conditions box when you're doing a rideshare app or hiring a moving company or um, having your mom or dad go into a nursing home, there are forced arbitration clauses in many, many different places. They are all null and void as of March of this year as it pertains to sexual assault and sexual harassment. That is fantastic. Congratulations um, to you on, on successfully um, getting this bill turned into a law. Um, also, you are the original co-sponsor of the Speak Out Act that just a few weeks ago was passed both uh, by both chambers of Congress. Tell us about that bill, that bill and how it builds on the on this law. Yeah, so this is uh, very exciting. I just was in the speaker's office yesterday. Um, what happens before a bill is uh, signed by the president, it's enrolled, it's called an enrollment, and the speaker of the house has to do that. So I was just with her yesterday, having that enrolled before it's sent over to the White House. But what this one does, we're calling it a one-two punch. You, you, we, we got rid of forced arbitration. Then the next one is now we are getting rid of non-disclosure agreements. All right. As it pertains to sexual assault and sexual harassment. Now, you think about how many cases are out there that we have heard about in different ways that involve non-disclosure agreements. That was the kind of the ultimate duct taping of a person's mouth. Um, you know, the forced arbitration, it was all handled behind closed doors. You still couldn't talk about but the non-disclosure agreements that just silences yeah. people who have survived horrible situations. Now you can take your case to court because we've ended forced arbitration if you choose to. And now if, if, if there's a non-disclosure agreement, um, that is that will be null and void as soon as President Biden signs this into law, which should happen within the next week or two. Um, wow. But yes, yeah, so it is right around the corner. This, so this is, this is breaking news. This is hot off the presses. Yeah. And this is a big, big deal. Uh, my good friend, Jamie Raskin, who maybe some of the people might know, he's um, a member of the of the Congress and he's out in the state of Maryland, but um, he's a constitutional law expert. But he called our legislation the most significant labor legislation this century. So really, really major. And so just think about the impacts that no longer do um, uh, survivors of sexual assault or harassment, if it's happened in the workplace or through one of these rideshare apps or whatever, where they have a non-disclosure agreement or forced arbitration, no longer do they have to be silenced. No longer do they only have a choice of that um, that imbalance of employer-employee relationship where the employer's making all the decisions. No longer will they be bound by that. So this is really, really major news. And we need everybody to be aware of this because you're going to have unscrupulous people who will not tell you yeah. that these are null and void. 
They will not tell you, but they are in forced arbitration is done as of March. Non-disclosure agreements will be done the day that President Biden signs that the, in the law. And that's just around the corner. We've passed this out of the House and the Senate. That is that is such fantastic news. And and as you mentioned, um, the ending forced arbitration for sexual assault and harassment law was signed back in March. But admittedly, yep. it was only weeks ago that I heard about this um, from you in, being in the audience of, of an event where you spoke uh, spoke about this. Um, so how do we how can we ensure that this law and the one that's forthcoming uh, becomes public knowledge so that everyone is aware and informed of, of their rights? Well, so we we need your help. Um, we need everybody who knows about this to talk about it. Um, Tanusia and I have co-written um, articles about this. We've got more work to do. Um, Lois Frankel, who's a member of Congress from Florida, she's one of my best friends. Um, she's the author of the non-disclosure agreement part. I'm a, I'm a lead sponsor of it, and we helped a lot make sure that we could get this through. We really use the same model that we did for our ending forced arbitration bill. Um, for the non-disclosure, and, it, and it's worked beautifully to get bipartisan support, to pass it out of the Senate, to pass it out of the House. And let me tell you, in 2022, that's not always easy to do in, in, the, in yeah. the nation's capital. So um, so we are, like, Tanusia has been absolutely great, even though she's in law school and um, it's busy as can be, she has been great. Like we, we appear together um, in a lot of these types of conversations and even in person. Um, so we're going to continue doing all we can to, to have engagements like this. But, and if Aaron, if you or anybody watching this have a suggestion for Tanuja or for me to um, a group that we should speak in front of, tell us because we will, we will make ourselves available. That it's that important. It is very common for, for a law to pass and then members of Congress just move on to the next thing. We're not going to do that. We're, we we got to talk about this because we know that there are people who won't talk about this and will want to keep this um, secret. But we, we want to make sure that people know about it. It is now the law of the land. Forced arbitration for sexual assault and sexual harassment is no longer effective. Soon the non-disclosure agreements will also no longer be effective in those cases. So um, we just have to spread the word. Please let us know where else, what other groups we can get in front of, because we are willing and happy to do that. That's great to know. And we'll, we we'll certainly will help spread the word and we'll keep you posted, um, on, on some fresh ideas or audiences, um, that we feel might uh, be helpful and continue to spread the word separately though. I would just, I mean, when you were talking earlier about how you guys, uh, will work together, I'm just interested to know how you guys met. Tanusha, I'll let you take that one. Absolutely, and thanks for having me today. We met because we have one topic very much in common and then it spread from there. We both have a strong desire to end forced arbitration and we got connected through various folks that were fighting the good fight. Um, when I started organizing at the company I was working at, so you mentioned I worked at Google, I was actually there for 11 years and I had worked in tech for 20 years. So going to law school is a bit of a career change. Um, but I thought maybe I'd share a little bit of the backstory and so that you don't have to just listen to me yeah. narrate it. Um, yeah. I brought visual aids. So I want you to put yourself back in 2018, right? The Me Too movement had been in like full swing for a year and so many different public figures um, had kind of fallen from grace. The Kavanaugh confirmation was, was happening with Dr. Blasey Ford and in tech, Susan Fowler had written what's called the Uber memo. And this is about her own sexual experience, um, harassment experiences. And then this story, the one that you see on the screen breaks where Andy Rubin, who's largely considered the father of Android, received a $90 million golden parachute or payout to leave the company quietly after facing credible allegations of sexual misconduct. And I think something in many of us just cracked especially um, folks that had gone through sexual harassment or news one. And so within a week, we were mobilizing across the company and we rallied around this woman, Claire Stapleton. She had this idea of a walkout. And the idea was that we were going to mobilize a massive walkout of employees who didn't see real change in the company and how it handled harassment. 
Um, and that was just kind of an extension of discrimination in all of our minds, right? And so we published our demands in the New York Magazine um, in the cut, which you can see here, and our desire to end forced arbitration was at the top because as Congressman Busto said that if you're silenced, like that's the gateway, right? You can't address any of these issues if you can't even talk about them and kind of share what your numbers are, how many people are being affected by this. So we had a walkout starting November 1st at 11, 10 a.m., get it, 11, 1. Um, and we kind of followed the sun, right? We're, Google is a global company. So we started in Asia Pacific and then we went west. And so you can just kind of see here, this is Singapore. Uh, we had a bunch of different places, our Zurich office, um, you know, Seattle, Paris, Dublin, Sydney. This is here in, in New York. You can kind of see me sc screaming at the crowd. And this is what the crowd looked like over at the Chelsea Pier side, right? And then it kept going for the rest of the day in Boston. This is one of my key um, fellow organizers, Vicky. And we ended the day in Mountain View where we realized that nearly 20,000 employees had walked off the job. So that's about a fifth of our full-time workforce. Yeah. And the initial impact of the walkout seemed fruitful, right? Companies renouncing their forced arbitration policies for sexual harassment. Um, but there was still a lot more work to do. Class actions were still being barred. Discrimination was still being forced into arbitration. And so a handful of us created a group called Googlers for Ending Forced Arbitration. So anything, you know, created a website, did a bunch of social media to get the word out, because as the congresswoman said, no one wants to talk about this. No one wants you to know your rights. And so we decided on three main strategies to get the word out um, across the country, across industries and demographics. And we, we threw everything at the wall that we could, right? It was in any kind of media campaign, connecting with lawmakers, connecting with experts, and the funny thing is that the further outside of Google we went to connect to other industries and workers, the more impact we made at Google. And so this is how we started getting connected with more members of, of Congress, right? So here's an example of where um, my colleague, Vicki Tardif, she was convincing the chief of staff for Representative Trahan to sign on to one of the pieces of legislation that would end forced arbitration. And the next day she did because it was just a matter of getting the word out and talking about the importance. So we didn't do this alone. We connected with many other survivors. You know, Congresswoman Justice mentioned the women at Sterling Jewelers, and we had an opportunity to meet them and, and connect with them and go talk to lawmakers as well. And so this is kind of how a lot of this came together. And so after months of campaigning, kind of built on the shoulders of other people that had been fighting for decades, Google finally ended forced arbitration. Um, but I like to kind of put that headline on top of this photo of us organizers when we were laughing because the way Google announced it, we were like, well, we only had a handful of these arbitration claims anyway. And, you know, the rest of us were like, that's not the story that you think it is. All that does is prove is that arbitration has this chilling effect when you force it on survivors and they can't talk about it, right? So that... That's a, a very kind of compacted history of how um, we met and the work that we're doing. And I I will say to, to the Congresswoman's last point, like the fight continues beyond kind of any particular company, beyond cases of sexual harassment in one particular area. It has to go to all different types of civil rights violations and safety violations. Um, and that work won't stop. The mix of people and the clients and the survivors that need to get their day in their court are counting on us. And so that's why we keep doing this. We want to make sure everybody knows their rights and keeps fighting to end forced arbitration. Uh, Tanuja, you are now enrolled in law school and you're on the board. Uh, you are a board chair, actually, for the Crime Victims Treatment Center, which you spoke a little bit about. Um, can you tell us a bit more about what you hope to pursue with your law degree, as well as with your role with CVTC um, and the work that you're doing there? Absolutely. You know, one of my main goals is to ensure that people can assert the rights that they're afforded. You know, the congresswoman and I have been doing this because we want people to know that they have these options, that they're not forced into arbitration and their employers are not really incentivized to tell them about that. And so we have to make sure we get the word out. And so one thing I love is like sitting in my contracts class and people reading these cases and learning that like people are being compelled into arbitration 
And people are asking, what is arbitration? It's like, okay, let me tell you what that's about. And then explaining, but you don't have to be compelled into this for this particular case of harm of sexual assault and harassment as all these young people are going into this field, right? And so getting the word out, being able to extend this protection to more and more civil rights violations. I think the twin bill that just passed Speak Out Now, actually, like, that's a great example of, okay, you got to put in the door. We're just going to keep opening it, opening, opening to help people avail themselves of more and more rights. So that's a huge part of what keeps me motivated to figure out how to take this law and kind of wield it for our objectives. That's fantastic. Um, and so one of my, I guess this is my final question for you guys, uh, resilience, our tagline is empowering survivors, ending sexual violence, which both of you have spoken about today. And it's at the center of the work that you're doing. Um, what is one thing that both of you would hope to see in the future, um, for the anti-rape uh, movement and, Along with that, what is one thing that every that you feel that everyone can be doing now to help end sexual violence or sexual harassment? You want to start, Tunisia, or you want me to? Um, go for it. Okay. <laughs> um, well, well, look, um, I can tell you what got this over the finish line. Um, we we had worked on this bill for five years. All right, five years it took to to pass this. Now we had to change some language to get some support. Is that on fast the or slow? Is that about that's you know what? I, I I guess by Washington standards, it's you know not bad. But but that said, it was still five years. But let me tell you what brought it over the finish line. It was the stories from the survivors. Um, we had to issue subpoenas in order for a group of some women who came in and testified before the House Judiciary Committee. The reason we had to issue subpoenas is because they were not allowed to talk about being sexually harassed and assaulted um, because they had non-disclosure agreements. They were operating under forced arbitration agreements, but um, their stories were so powerful that uh, we have members of the House Judiciary Committee saying they've never heard such powerful testimony in their entire congressional careers. So the reason I share that, especially with um, and, um, you know, the, and they're, they're hard, they're painful, they're emotional, they're everything about a, a person telling their story of being um, sexually assaulted um, or sexually harassed is, you know, is, is, can be absolutely traumatizing, but it also can help change the world. And, you know, to get this legislation passed, get this, I, I'm a Democrat. We had every Democrat vote for, for both of these bills, but we had 113 Republicans vote for the ending forced arbitration bill. 113. That's pretty amazing. We had 100 vote for the non-disclosure agreement, um, getting rid of non-disclosure agreements. That's pretty miraculous in, in Washington, D.C. But I, but I would argue that we got people on board who might not typically get on board because of those powerful stories. So I guess my message is, is if you are in a place um, where you can share your story to the right people who can change legislation, um, who can make a difference by hearing those stories, if, if you can do that, that's powerful. And, and that made all the difference for us. Fantastic. Tanuja? Yeah, it's actually very related. My my hope is that we start to, we talk about this problem with the same urgency that we talk about other problems and other epidemics. And I think, you know, what Congressman Bush just pointed out with the testimonies that statistics turned into stories and these five women like put in faces on things that were happening to millions of women and men across the country. Right. And so, and then it, it was super urgent because now you knew someone and you understood the impact of it. And so that is my hope that I think there can be fatigue when we talk about this topic because it's been happening for so long and because it's so widespread. And we want to get it to where, no, you feel compelled to move forward and make progress because you know someone that's been impacted and you've heard their story and you know how it impacts them. So that's my hope. Thank you for that. Um, that's my hope as well. 
Um, our conversation is coming to a close. That went so fast. I don't know how it felt for you guys. Um, but thank you so much to Nusha Gupta and Congresswoman Bustos, um, not only for being a part of this wonderful conversation today, but also for the incredible work that you're doing um, on behalf of uh, the sexual violence community. Um, can you both please let us know, how, our, let our audience know rather, how they can support you and your work moving forward? Um, sure, uh, please uh, reach out to us, to our office. Um, Heather, if uh, you can put our um, email address and, and phone number in the chat box so it's, it's there for people to see. Please get in touch with us if you'd like us to, to speak to any other group um, if there's anything we can do to help spread the word about this, we just we want to make sure that people know about what is now law. Um, and uh, it, it, it's something that is very, very important for people to be aware of. I would just add that I think networks are the ultimate currency in organizing. And I know that, you know, the way that there were whisper networks as part of the Me Too movement is I've connected with so many workers who are like, can you look at this employment agreement? Here's what happened to me. Do you know a particular lawyer in this state? So please reach out. I'm on all the social media channels and, and LinkedIn, happy to always help and connect. Thank you so much. Well, it's been our mission for over 48 years to support survivors and and, um, and to help move the, the movement forward of ending sexual violence. Um, we have a wonderful team of staff and volunteers that do this uh, really important work every day. And on their behalf, I just want to say thank you for your leadership and the and the roles that you have played to help move this this movement further. And to your point, there's more work to be done. Um, we will be we will be sharing this with our audience right now. I think we have over we have over thirty thousand followers. So we'll we'll be sharing this conversation with our community and and expect and ask that they do the same so that we so this becomes common knowledge and so that everybody is aware um, not only of what you what you guys are doing on their behalf but what their rights are uh, when it comes to sexual violence and sexual harassment and keep up the good work you guys and hope to stay connected with you. Thank you again for being here. Thank you, Erin. Thanks, Tanuja. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye.